this morning, we're in the Gospel of John. And it's John chapter 21 this morning. And I've entitled the message, What Now? Because at this point in John, Jesus has completed his earthly ministry. He has ministered to thousands, if not tens of thousands. He has performed countless miracles. He has fed 5,000 and 4,000 plus women and children. So upwards of 15 and add the two together, perhaps 30 to 50,000 people have been fed by Jesus Christ. He has cast out demons for multiple individuals. He has healed countless diseases and infirmities. He has even raised a few people from the dead. His ministry concluded largely in part when he was crucified, and that'd be John chapter 19. In John chapter 20, we read about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My friends, the gospel is that Jesus Christ, he's the Son of God, and he came to earth to die on the cross for the sins of the world, and that he was buried and rose again the third day. You see, Jesus Christ, if he had not died on the cross, he could not be the Savior for the world. But if he had not risen from the grave, he could not be the Savior because God promised that he would die and rise again. So my friends, Jesus Christ is alive. In the resurrection, some ladies went to meet him early Sunday morning, or not to meet him, to, to kind of treat the body, and they were surprised when the tomb was empty. The angels there spoke a few words to them, and, and Mary interacted with whom she thought was a gardener was actually Jesus Christ. From there she went back and ran to tell other disciples, Jesus Christ is alive. Most believed, but remember Thomas, he was one of the ones who didn't believe at first. Jesus Christ then appeared to his disciples a few different times. He appeared in the room where they were gathered. They were all apparently afraid, and, and maybe rightfully so. They had just crucified Jesus Christ, and, and so maybe they feared that they'd also face the same fate. And in this closed room, Jesus Christ appears. He even eats. He shows that he can eat bread and, and fish and he eats and demonstrates that he is truly risen. And then we come to John chapter 21. Jesus Christ has not quite ascended, but this is right at the very end. In John chapter 21, we're going to ask the question, what now? We're going to see in this passage of Scripture that sometimes the disciples of Jesus Christ stop following Jesus Christ. And I wish in my life and your life that that would never be the case. I wish that I could say, hey, ever since I trusted Jesus Christ at six years old, I followed Jesus Christ every single day. I wish I could say that, but I can't. And I would imagine if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can't say that either. I imagine if you're honest, like, I'll be honest, we'd have to say, no, there's some times that we ask this question, what now? There's some times I questioned. There's some times I wondered. There's some times I flat out said, you know what, right now I'll do my own thing. Anybody else with me this morning? Am I all alone up here on stage? Do I stand in your judgment this morning? You're like, wow, Pastor, you're a really bad guy up there. That's all right. We're going to read about these disciples who talked with Jesus Christ, who hugged on Jesus Christ. In fact, John, in the book of 1 John, says, our hands have handled. They've hugged him. They touched him. And yet, right now, they're going to walk away from Jesus Christ. There's an old children's song, an old song that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. And this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I'm speaking to all those Christians who have ever felt this question in their mind, what now? I've hit disappointment. I've hit discouragement. I've hit a problem. It wasn't what I expected. So what now? And let's see what the Word of God gives to us in John chapter 21 because God's Word is infinitely practical and touches us right where we're at. So let's please open to John chapter 21 and we'll look at the first 17 verses in John chapter 21. The Bible says this, After these things, 
Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Let's pause real quick. These are some disciples, aren't they? These are the well-known disciples. These are not some random followers. These are not some who just picked up Jesus along the way. These are ones who had lived and breathed and ministered with Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, if I can, the spokesman of the group. The sons of Zebedee, James and John. John, the writer of the Gospel of John. John, whom the Bible tells us, was the one whom Jesus loved. He was the most loved by Jesus of the disciples. He was closest to Jesus Christ. So it's James and John, it's Simon Peter, it's Nathaniel, and two others, and Thomas and two others who are not named. Verse 3, And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple, whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and had cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon then as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him the third time, I'm, I'm sorry, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would help us. Lord, you encourage our heart, and perhaps today there are some struggles that we're facing, temptation to turn back. Lord, I pray that today you would strengthen, encourage. Lord, that you'd help us to understand who you are and who we serve. Lord, I ask that everything that you want to be accomplished in this room today and online and after this, that would be accomplished. Lord, if there's someone here today who doesn't know you as Savior, that today they would trust you and believe in you. Lord, if there's someone here who's struggling today, they would turn towards you and follow you and commit to following you again. We love you. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. What happens after people follow Jesus for a while? It seems that at first someone will get saved and they'll trust in Jesus Christ. They'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they'll be saved and they get on fire. There's a passion, a fire that burns brightly. They're telling their co-workers, they're telling their friends, they're telling everyone about Jesus Christ. They experience perhaps some, some life and some vitality. The chains of bondage and some of the sin that bound them, they, they break free from them and they're excited and they love coming to church and they love being around the children of God and they love preaching, they love singing. And, and after a while, 
What can happen? The fire that once burned brightly begins to dim a little bit. The excitement that was once there wanes a little bit. The speech that was vocal before now becomes more silent. The, uh, the faithfulness that once was displayed is now not as commonly seen. What happens after we follow Jesus? And life hits. Disappointment strikes. What we thought would happen didn't quite happen. We got saved and we imagined that every day the sun would be shining. And yet after we're saved, sometimes there's clouds. We thought after we're saved that there'd never be another storm in life. And all of a sudden we're in the tsunami, hurricane, storm of the century of life. And we're drowning. What we thought didn't happen. Sometimes people drift away. Sometimes what was hot becomes cold. Sometimes where faithfulness was, now there's absence. And now there's carelessness. I see here in John chapter 21 some disciples who left their calling. You see, when Jesus showed up earlier in, in the gospel story, Jesus went to the sons of Zebedee. They're fishing. He goes, hey, put down your nets and follow me. And they put down their nets and they followed Jesus. And Jesus took them on the journey of their life for a little over three years. Boy, they saw things they never dreamed that they would see. They experienced things they never dreamed they'd experience. They heard things they'd never heard before. All because they simply followed Jesus. They saw Jesus and they saw him arrested and they all fled. They all deserted. They all ran away. They saw Jesus and he was crucified. They had seen him now two different times and he was risen from the grave. But now they went back fishing. As far as I can tell, what the scripture tells us, this is the first time they've been back fishing. They'd been with Jesus for so long that they hadn't been fishing. And all of a sudden, one day, Peter gets up, big, strong. I'll show you how strong he is. Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, throughout the gospel account, Peter is always, always saying something. Good and bad, both. He's always saying something. And Peter seems like the guy from the gospels who's always all in. When he is for Jesus, he's completely for Jesus. I'll die for you. When he runs from Jesus, he runs as far as he can from Jesus. When he, when he says, Jesus, no, you can't be the one that dies, the Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. And then the next time he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, he's all, or he's nothing. And right now he's a big, fat zero. He's a big, fat zero. And when he is his big, fat, zero place, he drags others with him. Do you know that we affect those around us? Did you know that? That who you're around will affect you? And Peter goes, I'm going fishing. And so James and John, hey, we'll go fishing. Thomas, man, Thomas is already struggling. Hey, I'll go fishing with you. And two other disciples, nameless disciples, hey, we'll go fishing as well. So they jump in the boats, and they start fishing. And they catch nothing. They'd lost their fisherman touch. They'd lost the, the, the golden look. Now, they'd fished for a lot of years, apparently, before this time, and apparently pretty successful. It appears the Scripture tells us at least James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had a few different boats, like a family fishing business. They'd been successful, and tonight, nothing happens. And then Jesus shows up again on the shore. And he asks a simple question, do you have any meat? Do you have any fish? And they're like, no. And so this random guy from the shore, they don't know it's Jesus yet, says, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, just work with me a second here. I've done some fishing. Have you? All right, I've done some fishing, and I usually don't take instructions from the non-fishermen. How about you? You're in the boat fishing, and some guy on shore is like, hey, try the other side of the boat. Like, I'm not gonna, you, what are you talking about? You're on the shore. You don't know what you're doing. Like, I'm not going to listen to you. For whatever reason, they're like, okay. 
like just a random situation. We're going to listen to some guy who's like, hey, hey, I've got perfect vision from the shore here. There's fish on the right side of the boat, 200 cubits out. Oh, thanks for looking at the fish for us. Now, as soon, as soon as they started to pull that net up, they realized it was loaded full of fishes. 153 fish, the Bible tells us. 153 fish. John, boy, John wasn't slow. John figured it out. And he goes, Simon, Peter, that's the Lord. That's Jesus. Remember Peter who's all in? Peter's like, I'm going to go see Jesus. Jumps in the water and swims to shore. This is Peter. He's like, you guys wait for the boat. I'm swimming. And he gets there. So we have these disciples who now have seen the resurrected Jesus two different times. The Bible says this is the third time he's now displayed himself. And they're fishing. But Jesus had clearly told them when he called them back in the early days of discipleship, listen, put aside your nets. I will not teach you to fish. I will teach you to fish for men. So now they're not fulfilling the calling that Jesus has called them to. They've gone back to their old path, to their old job, to the old life. And they're like, you know what? We're just going to fish. And Jesus gave them the greatest catch they'd ever experienced. I believe there's some powerful truths found in this account. You see, something extraordinary happened that day. Not because they were great fishermen. Something extraordinary happened when someone extraordinary showed up. And what the disciples are going to have to decide, they need to decide to follow what they know or who they know. They'll have to decide to follow what they know. They know fishing. So they'll have to choose to follow who they know. And my friends, this morning, it's the same question you and I must face. We must answer the same question to follow what I know or choose to follow who I know. And it's a question that we always have to face. Because the life of faith means that we won't know things. And we'll have to decide to follow Jesus even when we don't know. And it doesn't make sense. And so this account, I think, is very powerful for all those Christians who have ever wavered in their faith, who ever had a moment of doubt, who ever wondered, Jesus, is this really what you called me to? Because, Jesus, I failed you. I deserted you. I left you. And I know that I still can see you appear, but I failed you. I ran away from you in the garden. And if I had just stuck it out, boy, I could have been a faithful follower, but I've messed up. I've ruined it. And so now there's doubt. Now that's plaguing my mind. And so maybe it's better if I just go back to what I know and go fishing. And go back to my old lifestyle because I know that and I won't mess up again. I won't let you down again. You know what? It was great while it lasted and it was a lot of fun. I have some great memories. But maybe it's just better if I go fishing. But if anyone is going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ... If anyone is going to have true success as a follower of Jesus Christ, if we're going to have true victory in the life of a Christian, then we have to come to this kind of moment and decide whether we're going to follow what I know or who I know. And if we fast forward to the book of Acts, we're going to find these disciples and we're going to know the decision they make because they're going to be waiting in a room upstairs for for the Holy Spirit to show up. And when he does, heaven breaks loose. And there are thousands upon thousands that are saved. In fact, people make this accusation that these men have turned the world upside down. And so if you think God can use you, then stick around and follow who you know. If you think that God can still turn the world upside down, which he can, then you have to follow who you know, not what you know. In this little blip, in the disciples' story, I think it'll help you and me. Let's look at the story, and I'm going to give you three keys to following Jesus Christ. Three keys to following Jesus Christ found here. Three keys to have the extraordinary happen. Three keys to have a dedicated, lifelong service of Jesus Christ. 
Three keys to see the great things that God desires to do through us. Three keys to experience a life of faith and power and action and supernatural events. Three keys to live a life that will be pleasing to the one who died to save us. Three keys. Number one. Look in verse number 10. Jesus says this. Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fish, and 153, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Understand this, that if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, we must know this. We must set aside what we know for what we don't know. If we're going to follow Jesus Christ, we must set aside what we know for what we don't know. Jesus said, hey, go grab that net of fish. And Peter, who was not only loud, apparently was a beast of a man. Because the Bible makes two specific notations about this catch. Number one, there was 153. Point being, this was extraordinary. Number two, it says that for all the fish, the net wasn't broken. So apparently, this was a great catch, and typically, the net would be broken if they caught this many fish. So the, the Bible points that out to us. So this is a really big catch that strained the nets, and Simon Peter gets it all by himself. Apparently, a beast of a man. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll get that. Don't worry, boys. I just swam 200 cubits to shore to see Jesus, and I'll get the fish. So Peter runs down to the shore, grabs it, not in the water, grabs it and brings it up the What well, a beast. Amazing. But picture this now. Picture this on shore. Now we have Jesus Christ standing there, inviting, speaking, and we have on this side 153 fish, probably the greatest catch of all time in their life. They now had to make a decision. Do I follow what I know? Or do I follow who I know and what I don't know? You see, if I follow the fish, you know what? I know what the fish do. I know how much they'll bring at market. I know how long they'll last. I know who to sell them to. I know the security that 153 fish will bring. I know that it'll now launch my fishing career again. I know that I'll have some money, perhaps to hire another boat or buy another boat. I know that I'll have my bills paid. I know that I'll be esteemed. When I go to market with 153 fish, people will say, wow, that's the biggest catch we've ever seen. I'll have fame. I'll have prosperity. I'll have security. This I know. I know the fish. And Jesus says, drag the fish to land because now you have to decide. Do you want the fish or do you want me? The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My friends, I've known, many, I've known many Christians who can't let go of what they know. They know who Jesus Christ is, but they like the security of the catch. They like the comfort of the catch. They like the fame of the catch. They like the stability of the catch. And the, the devious part is that you can have a decent life with the catch. The bills can be paid with the catch. You have a mediocre success in life. You'll never have the supernatural, but it'll be, okay. it'll be just okay life. Your kids will probably be okay. Your job will be okay. Your life, there, there won't be many problems. It's stability. It's comfort. But to see God work through you, you have to leave what you know for what you don't know. And there are many Christians who can't ever walk away from what they know. They can't let their kids walk away from what they know. I've known kids who thought they ought to go away to Christian college and their parents are like, no, that's not right. It's too far. It's a waste of your time. Keep the comfort of the catch and the stability of what you know. My friends, God gives us that question again. Are you going to follow what you know or follow who you know? If you're going to be a disciple who is used by God, 
You've got to leave the comfort. You see, Christians often, we're guilty of this. We're not trying to follow Jesus. We're having him follow us. I read a story about a young boy playing wiffle ball. Now, I know that some people played wiffle ball over Thanksgiving. A young boy playing wiffle ball for the first time with his dad. The dad tossed the ball, and the boy swung, and a big swing and a miss. Gathered the ball, and the dad tossed it again. Another big swing and a miss. And a third time, tossed the ball, big swing and a miss. Finally, the boy, in frustration, said, Dad, you're not throwing the ball in the right place. The dad said, Son, where else can I throw it? Dad, throw where I'm swinging the bat. That's the way wiffle ball works, right? But that's the way we want to treat the Lord, isn't it? Lord, you follow me where I'm going. Then there's no turning back. If you're going to have years of service to Jesus Christ and going to see him do the supernatural in your life and in your heart and around you and use you to turn the world upside down, you have to learn to leave the catch. But number two, Jesus doesn't stop there. Look in verse number 12. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst to ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Not only must we just leave the comfort of the catch and leave what we know for what we don't know, but number two, we must simply follow simple instructions. Now don't miss this, friend. Sometimes people want to make the Christian life complicated. Jesus is there on shore and he gives one instruction with two parts. Come and eat. Come and dine. Sit down and eat. Come and dine. Jesus says, listen, just come eat. So at that moment that they were eating, they were in the perfect will of God. Were they not? Yes or no? Yeah. Why? Because they simply followed the Lord. He didn't ask them some theological question. He didn't say, listen, I want you to show your dedication. He simply said, come and eat. Come and dine. Sit down and eat, boys. I made some food for you. And if they didn't obey, they wouldn't have been in the will of God. If they had said, you know what, Lord? I'm not eating. They wouldn't have been in the will of God. Because Jesus had said, come and eat. And if we're going to have a lifetime of service to God as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have to learn to follow simple instructions. The Bible is filled with simple instructions. There are some massive concepts. There are some mysteries that we will never know till God comes back and transforms our mind and our bodies. But there's a lot of things that are just simple. Be ye kind one to another is simple. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Simple. Love one another. Pray for one another. Don't forsake this something together as a matter of some is. Simple instructions. Jesus has given us in the Bible simple instructions. Be a God-fearing husband, a God-fearing wife. Be a faithful employee. Be a good friend. Be, a, be content. Be satisfied. Walk in the Spirit. Simple instructions. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Simply follow simple instructions. Eat. Praise the Lord. Witness. Simple. 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 Well, Lord, I want to know 35 seconds from now and 35 years from now, and if I take these, man, we make it so complicated. Just keep it simple. The Christian life is not like an Ikea piece of furniture. If you ever bought something from Ikea, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see at the store this monument to a bookshelf and it comes in a one by one package I think they sell houses in four by four boxes you open the instructions and they're in 35 different languages and they're, they're confusing and as a true man you just take the instructions and you chuck them to the side who needs instructions I do, halfway through and you're like man, that shelf should have gone on a little bit earlier in life you know what, a little bit of glue and a saw we can make this thing fit good as new and sometimes we try to open up the Bible and think it's going to be like an Ikea instruction book where God says, listen, I'll just tell you the next step. Be faithful to me today. 
Have faith in me today. Trust me today. Follow me today. Today. Go to church. Eat lunch. Come back to church. Pray. Seek me. Follow simple instructions. And number three. Oh, and this is key. Number three is key. Not only must we set aside what we know for what we don't know, not only must we learn to follow simple instructions and simply follow simple instructions. Number three, we must realize that God's forgiveness is greater than my mistakes. This is Peter. There are sermons inside of what God did with Peter, but Jesus asked Peter three times, verses 15 uh, through, through 17, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He used different words there, but ultimately he was trying to get Peter to understand, Peter, I can still use you. Peter, you are not done for me yet. Peter, your mistakes are not greater than my ability to forgive. Peter had pulled himself out of, uh, 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 out of the contest. Peter said, listen, I'm done. I've messed up too much. I'm not worth it. And that's what the devil would like you to think. And yet our pride says, well, I can only come back to Jesus when I can figure it out. God's well of grace must have a bottom to it, we reason. We think a person can only request forgiveness so many times. And then God's grace runs out. And my friends, God says, listen, you can access me for grace and forgiveness every day of the week. And as you write that check, it never bounces. It never bounces. You'll always find my forgiveness. You'll always find my grace. And if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you must realize that God's forgiveness is greater than my mistakes. And someone could have said to Peter, Peter, you deserted the Lord. And Peter would have to say, you're right, I did. But his grace is greater than my mistakes. Paul echoes the same account. Paul says, I've killed for Jesus, yet his grace, God's grace, greater than Paul's mistakes. And the story echoes throughout the centuries that God is greater than anything you can do. Any mistake you make, any problem you have, any error in judgment or decisions, God's grace and forgiveness is greater than my mistakes. And if we're stuck here in our mistakes, we'll never get to see the supernatural power of God. I have decided... To follow Jesus, no turning back. Simple song. 150 years ago, or over 150 years ago, there was a great revival in Wales. During this revival, many missionaries were called to go to, the, to, the, to East India. There was a little place in East India at that time called Assam. It was primitive, full of tribes who were headhunters and cannibalistic. But to one of those communities, there came a group of American Baptist missionaries spreading the message of love and hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in one particular tribe, they succeeded in seeing a man converted, his wife, and his two children. The man's faith was contagious, and many villagers in that village began to accept Jesus Christ, but the chief of the village was angry. He cared more about the old path and the old religion and the old way of things in life. And so he summoned all of the villagers and he called this family, the dad, the mom, and the two children, and said, you must, you must renounce your faith in Jesus Christ and turn back or face public execution. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the Father said this, I have decided to follow Jesus. Enraged, the chief ordered that the archers shoot the two children, which they did. With his children now deceased at his feet, the chief asked, will you deny your faith? You've lost both your children. Will you lose your wife also? The man replied, Though no one joins me, still I will follow. The chief was beside himself in fury, and he asked, commanded the archers to kill the wife. 
And she was shot. Chief had asked the man one last time, will you now also turn your back on your faith or risk your own life? The man responded with these words, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. And he was killed. But something happened. With those deaths, the chief was moved. He pondered the question, why would a man and his wife and his children choose to lose their life for some story about a man who lived in a faraway place years and years before. There must be something to it. The story, the account that I read goes that eventually the chief said, I too want to become a Christian. From him, the gospel spread not only through that village, through countless other villages. And it is from that tribal interaction that we get the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. My friends, this morning you may be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Hopefully you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you, if you haven't, then today... Make today the day when you trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. But those who are Christians, there are times in our life where we're like, what now? I've made too many mistakes. What I thought would happen didn't happen. My expectations weren't met. I've been let down. Maybe I should just stay with the stability and the comfort of the catch and what I know. And Jesus says, don't follow what you know. Follow who you know. And when you follow me, Jesus says, just follow my simple instructions. And remember this, that my forgiveness is greater than any mistake you can make. And when we follow Jesus Christ, we then open ourselves up to the power of God. God can use us to turn the world upside down.